the Senate votes for state income tax relief for workers, and the UNC system could face major tuition and fees changes if Senate leaders get their way. I'm Kelly McCullen. The state Senate debated a plan this week that would drastically lower tuition at some UNC system campuses, guarantee stable tuition rates at the others, and regulate student fees. Henderson County Senator Tom Apodaca says Senate Bill 873 makes a promise to all future incoming UNC system students. That is, your tuition will not increase over your college career. That is defined as eight semesters for a standard BS degree, and it does go up to a five-year um, program for those programs that go five years, for those degrees that take five years. Senate Bill 873 would require a review, a reduction, and a cap on future increases in student fees across the university system. Five UNC system campuses would offer $500 per semester tuition. Those schools are moving east to west, Elizabeth City State, Federal State University, UNC, Pembroke, Winston-Salem State University, and Western Carolina University. What efforts um, have we employed to reach out to um, our HBCUs to, to better get any understanding regarding um, if this is indeed sure. the best um, approach? There's been so much miscommunication out there even at my alma mater, Western Carolina. I mean, some of the same concerns, well, do you not think $500 cheapens the reputation of the university? And my answer is no, it's a marketing ploy. Let's be very honest. This is to help get more students, higher quality students into these universities so they can sustain themselves and do it on a geographical basis across the state of North Carolina. A special scholarship fund will be created and offered through North Carolina A&T University and North Carolina Central University. This uh, scholarship fund will be what we consider equal to the Moorhead Scholar at Chapel Hill and the Parks Scholarship at NC State. The legislation calls upon the UNC Board of Governors and select system campuses to investigate a possible name change, but there's no requirement that any campus change names. It has been very successful at Pembroke, and they highly recommended it since they took the UNC label and then Pembroke after. First, I want to thank you for taking out the naming part because that is and has been a serious issue. Uh, for our constituents across this uh, state since a lot of people really sweated to get these uh, universities up and running Absolutely. and name is all some of us have left so I really appreciate you taking that out. Senate Democrats have questions about Senate Bill 873 but this legislation is backed by the very top Senate leadership but it could face heavy and skeptical scrutiny in the House. UNC TV is part of the UNC system. Senate leaders have raised the stakes on the teacher salary increase debate in our state. Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger announced a two-year plan to hike average teacher salaries to just over $54,000 a year. He says North Carolina's teacher pay ranking would jump from 47th to 24th. This means average teacher pay will be up almost $10,000, more than 20% since the 2013-2014 school year. Over the next two years, the plan will dramatically increase average teacher pay from $47,783 to $54,224. Governor Pat McCrory is promising he'll veto a House bill that would reconstitute a coal ash commission whose makeup was ruled unconstitutional originally. The House passed a bill that gives the governor appointment powers to five of seven seats on that coal ash board, but legislators would confirm the appointments. The McCrory administration says the executive branch should control that board, appoint its members, oversee its work, and have the power to remove any board members without legislative interference. Let's say we override the veto and we don't get appointments or we end up in court. Um, the backup plan in here is to constitute, uh, uh, give all these powers that go with the Coal Ash Commission to the Environmental Management Commission. The Senate unanimously approved increasing the state's income tax standard deduction to $17,500.
Every worker's first 17-5 would be state income tax free under the plan. This is a higher standard deduction than the House is offering in its budget bill. This could prove to be a budget negotiation point. Standard Senate deduction. Republican tax policy uh, writers say expanding our state's income tax standard deduction is a middle class tax cut that should happen this calendar year. Current state tax law is calling for a higher standard deduction, but it phases in over a few years later this decade. If you look at the numbers, it is clearly showing that um, it'll cost about $200 million when fully implemented, but 80, uh, roughly 80 to 82% of all of those dollars goes to people with income under $80,000, which is a huge plus for the middle class. Senate Republicans used Senate Bill 818 to tout their years-long efforts to change North Carolina's tax code toward a flattened state income tax rate where the lowest wage earners would pay zero state income taxes. It's not our money. It's their money, and we want to give it back to them with this zero bracket cut, which is a significant thing for lower-income people. If you uh, exclude the first 17-5 of a $35,000 job, you just about taking every bit of their tax liability away from them. Senate Democrats supported Senate Bill 818, but they say Republican leaders should reinstate the earned income tax credit, a policy that lets the poorest North Carolina families receive state tax refunds that might be larger than their state tax liability. I'm supporting it because I know we don't have here support for the earned income tax credit which would provide 80% of this $200 million to families below the $35,000 a year mark. It basically removed 75,000 taxpayers off the rolls completely. They don't even have to file. And, and additionally, the, the other ones that are there will actually get an additional, beyond what they've already got, an additional $115 per family of filing, married filing jointly. So that's another move in the direction of helping the middle class. Senate Bill 818 passed 48 to 0 and sends it to the House of Representatives. But the House has passed its budget with a call to increase the standard deduction in 2016, just not as much as the Senate proposes. The House has approved a legislative investigation on whether North Carolina can keep its health benefits promises to current and future state retirees. Lawmakers want to study the Retiree Health Benefit Fund. The worry is the state isn't saving enough money today to pay future health care benefits. It's called an unfunded liability. The report's deadline is the opening of the 2017 legislative session. The bill creates a 13-member committee made up of five from the House, five from the Senate, the state treasurer and the state executive administrator of the state health plan and a representative of the Board of Trustees of the state health plan. Union County Representative Craig Horn is here talking about the state health uh, retiree health plan. Excuse right. me. Uh, is the state making promises it can't keep in the future to our retirees? It has, and we want to stop that. We can't continue down this path because fundamentally it's a shell game. Uh, look over here at this bright, shiny future, but oh well, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right, maybe it won't be there. Bad deal. How, um, how well is this issue studied at present moment? Because if you can get your bill through, it will, um, right. it will study the issue at least. So is there a problem? Is there possibility a problem with state promises versus retiree benefits? Well, I'm going to be optimistic to the extent that I don't think there's presently a problem, but I see the train coming down the tracks. We need to ensure that we are on a track that will ensure that promises made, promises kept. And that's what retirement benefits are all about. Promises made and promises kept. For us to promise something that we can't deliver, that's not a promises made, promises kept. That's a, that's, that's a, a, a shell game or a, what, every, uh, what is it that Bernie Madoff, the uh, Ponzi scheme. We can't do that. We shouldn't do that. Well, right now, we're not there as a state, but right. a lot of states have made quote unquote promises they can't keep in yep. the future, but the economies change. Demographics change, the size of government changes. Can governments today know what's going to happen 30 years out? Because they always you always blame the guy from 30 years ago for underfunding and overpromising. That's right. Well, our our crystal ball isn't any better than anyone else's crystal ball. We try very hard to, based on data, we expect this, this, and this, and and that's a good way to plan, but it's a bad way to promise. 
there's a, there's a long distance between a good plan and practical implementation of that plan. And that's why we have to be fully aware of what our challenges may be, what our challenges are presently, and balance that against what we can, quote, unquote, guarantee our retirees that have served, served this state well for long periods of time based on a future promise and we've, that we've got to deliver. Let us, instead of over-promise and under-deliver, how about we turn that over and under-promise and over-deliver? That's not, by the way, that's not a thing politicians like to do. They would rather over-promise. How do you see the situation right now? How is the state retiree health care benefits plans, those systems in place? And uh, it, it, what needs to be done now? Because you launched a study, it could, that result could be before the election or it could no. be in time for 2017's long session. Where do you see us going long term? Well, we are counting on this study commission coming back with solid recommendations. Here's what needs to be done in order to shore up the future for our retirees. That's the purpose of this commission, rather than us try to second guess going in. We wouldn't be studying it if we didn't sense that there could be a problem. I'm just, not a saying, sense, just a sense. Just a sense. Okay. Again, we are doing our, our folks a disservice if we aren't looking ahead to ensure that we're going down the right track. 10 years ago, we were pretty certain that's the right track, but 10 years ago isn't today. Today, it's a different paradigm. It's a different economy. Uh, 10 years ago, we were not quite into the recession, and now we're suffering from the results of the re recession. We need to make sure we've made the appropriate adjustments in order to ensure that our retirees are treated fairly. This report, when it comes out, will be only recommendations. There will not be. The report can't pass any laws or rules correct. changes. Correct. It'll be up to you as legislators to decide if reform is needed. Is that right? That's correct. Representative Craig Horn, Union County, you're running this bill. We'll study it. Report due sometime before the 2017 legislative session. Correct. Thank so you, I look forward to it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. The House is pushing a larger transportation rules bill to answer requests made by a legislative oversight committee. Policies ranging from local government consultation on road projects to emailing toll road bills to drivers as part of this bill. But there are some new bicycle safety rules in the legislation that are in the debate. House legislators are rolling the proposals of a transportation policy oversight committee into one large bill called House Bill 959. It does many things, including allowing several DMV services to be offered online, require that local governments be at least consulted when state transportation projects will affect their local towns, and add new safety mandates for on-road bicycling, including required bicycle lamps or lightly colored clothing for bicyclists at night. Dark clothing and a bicycle at night is just impossible to see. And so I have a lot of requests from local authorities on the coast to uh, have additional lighting or vests or whatever the most reasonable cost would be. And because I always get the, the uh, question, how about the cost of it? Well, if you can't afford the light, then don't drive at night. I see a bunch of nanny state laws here um, on this bicycle stuff. I had no idea you're supposed to have a lamp on the front of your bike. We ride bikes down at the beach all the time. They're old bikes. They, uh, they do have a light on the back, but usually the battery's dead. You're not going to so say, oh, we're not going riding because the battery's dead. It's, um, I could see this stuff on a major state road where the speed limit's 55, but where you're riding around in a 25 or 30 mile an hour, you're now breaking the law half the time. The bicycle safety debate yielded to a brief discussion on mopeds. Some lawmakers say we're seeing more mopeds on the highways and they're slowing down vehicle traffic. The bill does nothing to mopeds except adjust state law to better define what is a moped in line with new technology. Now we're starting to see a lot of mopeds <clears throat> in the travel lanes of highways and that's because now we're requiring them to have insurance and a tag and so they're entitled to use the road just like everybody else, and I have noticed that that's exactly what they're doing, and we're going to see more of that, not less, because the law of unintended consequences have not been repealed. If I may, I'd like to make a comment concerning that as well. Um, they were already riding in the middle of the road before they had to have driver's license and tags, but anyway. The House bill is moving, and supporters say some provisions within House Bill 959 will need deeper discussion and development likely during the 2017 long legislative session. A bipartisan House group wants to end discrimination against motorcyclists. They say state transportation policies can ignore motorcycle needs and even impede motorcycle enjoyment. 
It's even reported to some lawmakers that some parking decks are discouraging motorcycle parking. So motorcyclers are going in parking decks and may see signs that say no motorcyclers or may be refused to access those parking things. So it's really, it's really that simple. So the bill basically says you, you can't do that. You just can't prohibit uh, people from accessing parking decks or other uh, parking uh, areas that somehow do with government or state funded or assisted. Public policy polling released new polls this week showing some very tight statewide races for office. The major races are McCrory Cooper for governor, Dan Forrest, Linda Coleman for lieutenant governor, even the state treasurer's race, all statistically tied. Josh Stein leads Buck Newton by one point in the state attorney general's race. Tom Jensen is the director of public policy polling and thank you for being on the show, sir. Good to be with you. Well, I look at these statewide races, that's the focus of this show, and um, tight. What Josh Stein has a one point lead, everyone else is tied. How can that be? <laughs> we really are about the most divided state in the country now politically. It's a situation where all of our key races, the last 10 years or so have generally been decided by one or two points and it looks like this year is going to go right down to that. You have about 45 percent of voters who are always going to vote for the Democrat, about 45 percent who are always going to vote for the Republican, and over the next six months all this fight for a very small swath of the electorate. Well, that small swath is there. Uh, people seem to think HB2 could affect the state ballot. Would it affect the state ballot more than Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton being <laughs> at the top of, uh, of the tickets, respectively? I think the presidential race is probably going to be the biggest determiner of what happens in the governor's race. You're just not going to see that much difference between how people vote in those different races. So as long as the presidential race stays close, the governor's race is going to stay close. HB2 certainly is unpopular, but we've been polling this race for two years now. Neither candidate's ever been ahead by more than three points. So I think there's really nothing that's going to turn this governor's race into anything other than a down-the-middle toss-up. We're looking at polling in gubernatorial races, even legislative races. They're tied. Some side would say, well, HB2 is bringing down the incumbent's advantage. But if people are so angry about HB2, wouldn't Roy Cooper be well ahead of McCrory at this point as an agent of change for the state? How do you interpret that? I think it's a situation where HB2 is really unpopular, but it's not a big enough issue that it's going to really swing the governor's race one way or the other. We've just seen this situation where uh, they're just so closely matched that nothing that's happened over the last couple of years has really flipped that in a big way, uh, one way or another. I do think that HB2 in particular legislative districts is going to cause some Republican incumbents difficulties in suburban Wake County, suburban Mecklenburg County that kind of thing, but I think it has less of an impact on the governor's race. What issues heading in to election day are going to be big in North Carolina? HB2 is big for now. Do you ever get away from security, schools, and the economy? No, those are pretty much always the biggest things. And, you know, one thing that's really, I think, going to be the biggest thing in the election isn't necessarily the specific issues, but just the general broad theme. Has North Carolina gotten better over the last four years or not? And if you think it has gotten better, is that because of Pat McCrory or is it because of Barack Obama? Who are you giving the credit to? That sort of thing. So it's going to be, I think, a big referendum basically on where we've come over the last few years. Can you look at polls today and they tell you anything about what's going to happen in the fall or is it going to be a slugfest, a 12 round battle up and down <laughs> the ballot and we'll go to the scorecards on election night? I definitely think that we could be talking the Monday night before the election right here and we wouldn't know who's going to win the governor's race. I really think it's going to be that kind of contest. And you usually have a pretty good general idea this far out how it's going to turn out. In 2012, we knew that Pat McCrory had a substantial advantage at this point and it held that way and sort of similar situation this year. It's very close and I think that'll stay. For the average poll, you see uh, you know, certain states, Trump may be up two, three points or the governor may be up two, three points in North Carolina or Roy Cooper's. At what point do you start saying there is a distinct advantage that, that yeah, okay, this person has the sure. lead? You have to have somebody up by five points or more to really say that anybody has the advantage one way or the other. We have never, in two years of polling Roy Cooper against McCrory, had either of them up by more than five points. So this has been a toss-up from day one, and I think it's going to stay that way to the end. Will it take money to push that needle five percent either way? Uh, I think we're going to certainly see the same sort of level of ads that we did in 2014 in the Senate race. This is the premier governor's race in the country. Tens of millions are going to come in on both sides, but I think it ultimately won't make that big of a difference because it's such a tight race. Tom Jensen, public policy polling. Look him up. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Kelly.
North Carolina is poised to allow pharmacists to sell anti-overdose drugs without a prescription. The brand name is Narcan, would be sold to anyone as a nasal spray. It quickly reverses otherwise fatal effects of an opioid overdose from drugs like heroin or strong prescription painkillers. It clears those drugs from the brain. I think we're maybe the second or third state in the union to uh, do something of this nature that would save lives for people who are overdosing on opioids. Some House Republicans and Democrats are joining to propose a new process for reforming our lowest performing public elementary schools. Their proposal would call these schools achievement schools as part of a small pilot program where local school districts would oversee reform efforts at 15 struggling elementary schools. A charter school organization would manage five additional low performing campuses under a state appointed leadership model. Schools that couldn't improve over that five year test run could face closure if the pilot program become permanent. Representative Cecil Brockwin of Guilford County has signed on to this bill. It it appears to challenge the status quo of traditional public education, and it's just a pilot program affecting a limited number of schools. Am I correct? Yes. It would only affect 20 schools total. And we start with 20. What happens to those 20 schools? Are they all underperforming schools under this proposed pilot? No, and that's one thing that I'm happy to talk to you about because uh, 15 schools uh, would be under the uh, LEA control, the local uh, educative board, uh, and that's actually something that 70 or everyone agrees with, and that's 75 percent of this bill, uh, and it's uh, something that every single person uh, that I've talked to uh, has agreed with because it allows our uh, local uh, education board to uh, have the control. Uh, what people seem to be disagreeing with is the 25 percent of the bill uh, that allows charter schools to take over a low-performing school. What are you looking to get out of this pilot if the local traditional school board oversees reform for 15 schools and a charter school oversees the remaining five. What are you hoping to learn from this in this partnership, if it's even a partnership? Well, I'm happy to uh, team up with Rob Bryant is because this bill and only the only thing that Achievement School actually means is that we're focusing on our low performing schools and we want to help those schools succeed and achieve. Uh, right now there's 600 uh, low performing schools in North Carolina and this bill only affects 20 of those schools. Uh, you, There was a report done by Charter School Alliance that DPI uh, approved using DPI data that said that these, uh, this data was accurate, that said that 37% of African Americans in our traditional schools are achieving uh, at grade level. That to me, if that was, it, excuse me, people might get upset with me when I say this, but if that was our uh, white population, if we had 30% of our white population in our traditional public schools that were achieving at a rate of 37%, it would be a crisis. And it is a crisis right now in our traditional public schools for our African American population. Where do you, where do you lay the accountability as you describe 37% uh, at grade level, 63% not? That lack of performance, allegedly, uh, where do you lay that accountability? It's on everybody, you know. Uh, it's 2016 in this country, uh, and we have numbers like this. You know, every single person, Democrat, ha have, has had power, and Republicans have had power, and so we're both to blame. And I don't care who gets the credit for it, and I, I don't care to blame anybody for it. I, I only want to solve the issue, and that's why I am supporting this bipartisan legislation uh, with Representative Rob Bryant because I'm sick and tired of the rhetoric coming from mainly my side that wants to always oppose cha change to the status quo system. And status quo right now is producing at a level of 37 percent of a rate for people who look like me. And that is a crisis. And I will always be against uh, status quo and I'm against status quo for any Democrat uh, when it comes to uh, education. How long will your pilot program last? So it would take up a year uh, for it to be implemented, letting the superintendent come in there and choosing the best school uh, to fit. Uh, and, you know, up to five years, you know, if it's succeeding, then the pilot program, you know, obviously we, we hope we can, it will last longer. But, you know, if it doesn't succeed, if we, we don't see achievement, uh, then it, it's, those schools can't stay uh, open. You know, that's one thing that I will say about this program. That's another great asset is that if it's not doing a good job, if it's not succeeding, then it has to end. Right now we've had traditional public schools that have been open for years, 50 plus years, that are low performing and they're still open. That, that's a school that neither you or I would send our kid to and yet we have 
people, parents who have been having to send their kids to those schools for years and for decades, and that is a crisis. Representative Cecil Brogman from Guilford County, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. The House passed legislation to let former charter school teachers purchase retirement credit once they return to the traditional public school from their charter job. Teachers who left the public classroom for charter schools could buy it back up to five years of retirement service by making one lump sum payment. Those teachers would need to have five years of teaching experience, so teachers, you couldn't buy more retirement time than you have experience on the job. So it honors te the teaching profession. Um, they are limited to five years of um, that they can purchase uh, for the retirement system. So they are putting money into the retirement system, so the retirement system stays strong, and, but it still honors that teacher for their service. Former state representative and state senator Earlene Parman was honored this week for her legislative service to our state and to Forsyth County. Ms. Parman passed away in March 2016. She served as a state senator, It was a five-term House representative, and served 12 years as a Forsyth County Commissioner. So glad you watched the show this week. Follow us on Facebook. Search for the North Carolina Channel. You'll find clips and information there. Leave us a comment if you will. You can also find our show streaming online at video.unctv.org. We'll see you next time. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.